Well, welcome to today's webinar, Internal Audit Skills Training, Field Work. Uh, I'm Jim Kaplan, founder and owner of AuditNet, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Joining us is Bill Woodington, principal of Woodington Training Solutions, who will cover field work today. Let me have Bill introduce himself and give you a brief overview of his background, and then I'll cover the housekeeping items for the webinar, and we'll get right into the meat of the subject today. Bill, if you would. Yeah, welcome everybody. Welcome back to many of you. Again, our webinar today is related to field work. This is a topic out of my new auditor training class. And I'll have my contact information after the webinar today. I teach on-site seminars. I worked for Wells Fargo for 22 years in the audit group. The last 18 of those years as head of learning and development. I'm currently offering three internal auditing seminars and three professional development seminars. I'd love to talk to you after our webinar today about bringing training into your company. So welcome to everyone. I'm looking forward to our webinar today. Well, thanks, Bill. Before we uh, begin today's webinar, I do need to cover some housekeeping items. Uh, there's a little bit of information about me and some information about AuditNet on the next two slides. Uh, this webinar and its material are the property of AuditNet and Woodington Training Solutions. Unauthorized usage or recording of this webinar or any of its material is strictly forbidden. We are recording the webinar and if you paid the registration fee you'll be provided access to that recording within five business days. It says two but we're leaving five business days in order to give us some time to download and uh, and clean the, uh, the recording up. Uh, downloading or otherwise duplicating the webinar recording is expressly prohibited. We also request that everyone fill out the online evaluation questions that you'll see at the end of the webinar. Your feedback is very valuable, so please take a minute or two to complete the survey. In addition, because this webinar qualifies for CPE credits, we will be putting up polling questions in compliance with NASBA rules and standards. Those answering the questions will receive their CPE certificate by email within 7 to 10 business days. You have an opportunity both during and at the end of the webinar to ask questions. Submit your questions during the presentation via the chat window at the lower right hand box on your screen. Type your question and press return to send it. Any question we're unable to answer by the end of the webinar will be answered via email directly within 48 hours. As moderator, I will be monitoring the questions. Uh, Bill will be launching the polls and uh, I'll be standing by just in case there are any technical difficulties. Uh, in addition, if GoToWebinar stops working, you may need to close and restart. You can always dial in and listen and follow along with the handout. That is if you paid for today's webinar. And again, if you paid for today's webinar, you will be getting a link to the recording. You'll be getting the handouts and you'll also be getting two documents that we have put together for this webinar. One is a uh, field work uh, quality control uh, template that you can use for your audits. And the other is audit uh, documentation uh, manual that we put together for AuditNet. It's a 39-page manual, so it really uh, would benefit you if, uh, if you haven't paid for today's webinar. You can uh, pay after the fact. And we also offer a group rate so that you can pay for uh, one, one fee and have everybody within your organization uh, that attends, attends the webinar can receive CPE. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Bill and uh, get on with today's topic. Bill? Welcome again, everyone. As I said, this is a topic out of my new auditor training class, field work, the four phases of the audit process, planning, field work, which we're talking about today, reporting and wrap-up, and follow-up. Field work, when I teach this in the live classroom, we spend well, the better part of a day on this topic, at least a half a day, related to field work, and we'll go through the key learning points as we go through this topic today. The bread and butter of what internal auditors have done for years is the field work phase of the audit process, the testing of internal controls for control effectiveness. Well, here are our learning objectives for today. And as I've said before, whenever you go through training, you should always see learning objectives. So we'll get us grounded again. I know some of the terminology we've talked in the, about in the previous webinars. I'll just review a few of those concepts as we start today. And then we'll get into the testing techniques and work paper 
quality issues. We'll look at some work papers. I'll actually bring up a few work papers today that we'll take a look at. We'll talk about good audit evidence, what constitutes good audit evidence. We'll talk about work paper documentation guidelines and some of the basic things you should remember of what you should include in work papers and maybe what you should not include in work papers. We'll also talk about issues and recommendations. Many audit organizations call them findings and recommendations. Same thing, uh, INRs or FNRs, issues and recommendations or findings and recommendations. And we'll go through some key learning points there as well. Again, if you ever take the certified internal auditor exam, many of the topics and the learning points that we'll go through today are included on that exam. I do teach the CIA exam review class, so again, if you ever want me to come into your organization and deliver that training, I would love to do it. Again, I'll have my contact information at the end of the webinar. I am an IIA instructor for the CIA review class. Well, let's start out with some basic concepts that we talked about in some of our previous webinars. As we get into field work now, let's talk about internal control, the difference between control adequacy and control effectiveness. And always remember this. In the planning phase of an audit project, the in-charge auditor is assessing control adequacy, the design of the control. On paper, does this look like a good control? On paper, does this look like this control would have a substantial effect in mitigating risk? And then in the fieldwork phase, what we're talking about today, we look at control effectiveness. Is the control working? And remember, a control could be adequate, but not effective. Remember the example I gave in one of our previous webinars. When I worked at Wells Fargo, I was on an audit one time, and we were auditing the vault operations. And one of the controls we were going to test was dual control over the vault. Now, when we planned the audit, we looked at the procedure related to dual control. This is control adequacy now. The design looked great. In other words, the procedure stated that two different people would need to be present to open the vault door. Okay? One person would have the combination. One person would have the key. On paper, this looks like a great control on paper, control adequacy. This control would be totally adequate in mitigating risk. The risk of what? The risk of theft, the risk of one person getting into the vault and stealing money out of the vault. But now we go to field work and we go to test that control for control effectiveness. Is the control actually working? Does it really take two different people to open the vault? And I showed up to watch them open the vault one morning and sure enough, one person had the key and another person had the combination. And so it looked like the control was effective. And I was about to leave the vault and document that. But before I left, I asked one final question. Just out of curiosity, do you have any spare keys to the vault? And sure enough, they had all of these spare keys kept in an unlocked drawer. So anybody who had the combination could easily get at a spare key and when nobody was looking, that one person could have got into the vault. The control was adequate but not effective. Remember, in field work, we're always testing for control effectiveness. All right, just to make sure you're paying attention right at the start here, let's launch our first polling question here. And let me put this in front of you here. And I'm going to launch the poll for you. Control adequacy refers to which of the following? See how well you do here. Sixty-eight percent of you have voted so far. Not effectiveness now. This is adequacy. Control adequacy refers to which of the following? What I was just describing. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. A few of you missed this one. Let me share the results here. The correct answer is the third one, letter C, if you will, control design. Control adequacy equals control design. Is the design of the control adequate? On paper, is this a good control? Based on the design, does it look like this control would have a substantial effect on reducing inherent risk? 
Okay. All right, I'm going to hide the results here. Let's go to our next one, it relates to the same topic now. If that's control adequacy, let me launch our next poll here. Control effectiveness refers to which of the following? You know now what control adequacy is. What does control effectiveness refer to? Seventy-one percent of you have voted. I'll just leave the poll open here for just a little bit longer. And the results are excellent so far. Nobody's missed this yet. Okay. I'm going to close the poll here and share the results. And again, you're right. Control effectiveness refers to is the control working? All right, excellent results, everyone. OK, let's go on with the presentation. And let's talk more now. Terminology, I just want to get us all grounded on the same page. We're in field work now where we're testing for control effectiveness. And there are different types of controls. Preventive controls, sometimes you see this described as preventative. Same thing, or detective controls. Preventive controls, what is that? They prevent something bad, if you will, from happening. Detective controls detect something bad that has already happened, just in layman's terms, putting it in that in some language here. An example, and you see some examples on this PowerPoint. For example, segregation of duties, the control I was just describing all the, over the vault, where it requires two different people to open the vault. That prevents one person from getting into the vault and stealing money out of the vault. Detective controls, like reconciling, reconciliation, will detect a problem after it's already occurred. For example, when I was at Wells Fargo, I remember one time there was a large fraud. And it related to a general ledger account, like a clearing account, where items would come into the general ledger account and then should have gone out of the general ledger account within a day's time. Well, nobody was reconciling this account, and someone was manipulating this account for fraudulent purposes. Once the reconciliation control was implemented, this fraud was detected. Unfortunately, it went on for a long time. But it was detected after the fact. Now, a detective control, if it's working properly, should be able to catch something like that in the early stages and help mitigate the losses related to that particular event. Now remember when we talked about risk, for those of you who attended our risk webinar a few weeks ago, we said to have risk, you must have probability and impact. Probability, the chance that something bad could happen, and impact, the loss itself. And the reason I bring that up here is preventive controls probably, for the most part, reduce probability. And detective controls probably, for the most part, reduce impact. I remember that was on the CIA exam. That's not always true. But I remember when I took the CIA exam, that was, the, that was a question that was on the exam. Preventive and detective controls. I would guess that most of your testing, when you're out in field work, would be testing preventive controls. Most organizations have more preventive than detective controls. They're more cost effective. All right, And obviously, we're preventing things we don't want to happen. But anyway, preventive controls and detective controls. And one of the things that will happen in the planning phase of an audit is the in-charge auditor will actually identify the controls the business has in place and flag the control as either preventive or detective. It actually helps in the testing of those controls if we know if it's a preventive control or a detective control. It helps us write audit programs for testing control effectiveness. Remember, a learning point today in field work, you're always testing for control effectiveness. And what is control effectiveness? Is the control actually working? Well, does it really take two people to open the vault door? Well, here's some IIA standards related to field work. And in our webinar on Monday related to internal auditing basics, 
we looked at some of the IIA standards. We went out to the IIA, the Institute of Internal Auditors. That's what that acronym stands for, website. And you should have this on your favorites, www.theiia.org is the Institute of Internal Auditors website. www.theiia.org is where you'll get at the IIA standards. The first tab on the left will allow you to launch the standards. And I won't spend a lot of time on the standards today. Again, just wanted you to remember there are standards for our profession that relate to field work. We talked about COSO, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, the components of internal control on our, at our webinar on Monday. And the bullets you're seeing under 2120A1 are what controls should be doing if they're working. These are the COSO objectives that help organizations achieve their objectives related to reliability and integrity of financial operational information. Controls help ensure the effectiveness and efficiency of operations, ensure the safeguarding of assets, and controls help ensure compliance with laws, regulations, etc. If controls are working, those bullets that you're seeing there, that's what should be happening. Remember the components of internal control that we talked about on the webinar on Monday that COSO defined. Control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, and monitoring. Those five components of internal control should be in place, and we're testing here in field work to see if those controls are actually working. And we'll talk more about some of these standards here in just a little bit, specifically 2310, identifying information, where it says that auditors must identify sufficient, reliable, relevant, useful information. We'll talk about what that means here in just a few minutes. All right, again, these are some of the standards that relate to field work. Well, if you ever had an internal auditing class in college, you may have had a textbook by Lawrence B. Sawyer, you know, a pioneer in the field of internal auditing, and his book, The Practice of Modern Internal Auditing, is on the shelves of many internal audit organizations. In fact, uh, if you go to the IIA bookstore, you'll notice the new sixth edition has just come out. And it's an authoritative reference manual guide on the expectations for what we do here in the internal auditing profession. And I just took a little piece, I won't read all this to you, a little piece about testing. You know, testing what? When I was in, at Wells Fargo, we had test documents. We had an electronic work paper system, Lotus Notes we used at Wells Fargo. And our, when we were in field work and we were documenting the testing of internal controls, those documents were titled test documents. Why? Because we're testing for control effectiveness. The procedures we're applying are helping us determine, is the control actually working? Is the control effective? All right? And if you don't have this book on your shelves in your audit group, you might want to recommend buying one. It's a great resource to have on file, especially if you have new auditors who are not familiar with the internal auditing profession. Just a little more lead in here with regard to testing um, are the objectives of testing you see listed on the slide here. And really, again, I just keep coming back to the overall objective is to, do, is to determine if the control is actually working. Is the control effective? All right? And there'll be a number of different ways that you can test a control to come to that conclusion. And we'll look at some of those ways today as we get into our webinar on the best ways to help determine if controls are effective or not. Testing determines whether something is as it should be. You see there at the bottom, is the control effective? Is the control actually working? Well, here we go with some different testing techniques. Observing or observation was the one I just described for you in the example I gave with the vault. Actually watching them open the vault. But let me say this about the observation te testing technique. It is limited in its overall effectiveness. And by that I mean the fact that you are there watching them may make the business partner behave differently than they normally do. Having an auditor watch you open the vault may be the one time they actually have two people open the vault door under dual control, right? So 
typically, I'm not saying you shouldn't use observation to test for control effectiveness, but you usually want to accompany, accompany it with another testing technique. All right, some of the ones that are actually listed on this slide. Questioning is a testing technique. Now next week, and I hope all of you are signed up to attend our webinar on assertiveness training, a behavioral topic next week, but we'll also get into some interview skills topic, asking questions to a business partner, interviewing business partners. And remember, well, I shouldn't say remember because we really haven't talked about this, but I'll just say this, the best question is the open-ended, unbiased question. In other words, when I approach the business partner about their vault, I would not say, you wouldn't just let one person open the vault, would you? <laughs> That's biased. It's letting them know that one person shouldn't open the vault. And it's a closed-ended question. They could answer just yes or no. They'd say, no, no. <laughs> What's a better question? Tell me how you open your vault or what procedures, let me put it in a question form, what procedures do you use to open the vault, right? Open, unbiased, I don't know what they're going to tell me. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the others here in just a minute, the analysis technique, verifying technique, and you know, an old adage in the audit profession is trust but verify. In other words, you do ask questions to the business partner and you should trust what they tell you is true, but you need to follow that up with some other type of testing technique verifying that what they told you is actually true. Too many, and I've seen this, I saw this recently, too many audit organizations rely too much on a verbal representation as their only evidence for whether the control is effective or not. Hey, Mr. Business Partner, how do you open the vault? Oh, we open it under dual control. Two people are required to open the vault. Great. The vault is under dual control. No. <laughs> what did I do to verify what they told me is true? Trust but verify. More to come as we go through this today. Well, let's talk a little bit about work paper quality. Now, I'm going to mention this several times today because I believe in repetition, but always ask yourself this question when you're done with your work paper. When you're done testing an internal control for effectiveness, ask this question. Would any third-party person, anyone, who took a look at your work, come to the same conclusion you did, the control's effective or the control's not effective, and be able to re-perform the test themselves. What? Would anybody be able to look at your work paper and come to the same conclusion you did and be able to re-perform the test? Okay, and we'll come back to this here in a minute. How can you ensure that? Well, we'll talk about audit evidence here in just a minute. Now, you'll notice in the fifth bullet down, it says that your work paper should tell a story. And next week, when we do our assertiveness training, I'll describe a little activity that I use when I do that in, a fa in the face-to-face -face version of my new auditor class. But basically, your work paper should tell a story to who? Back to the in-charge auditor. Back to your audit manager back to the regulators, back to the public accountants, back to anyone who looks at your work that controls are adequate and effective. They're the best controls, they're well designed, control adequacy, and they're actually working control effectiveness. Remember, any third party person should be able to read the story that your work paper tells and come to the same conclusion you did. The control is effective. And if they want to reperform the test themselves to be able to come to that same conclusion, they can look at the items that you looked at. They can retest if they want to, and they would come to the same conclusion you did. Now, we'll be talking about work paper documentation in our webinar, and you'll notice as I go through the PowerPoints, I'm not a big believer in reading bullet by bullet. I hope you appreciate that. I mean, I always hated that. I, I can read the bullets. And remember what Jim said at the start today, if you do pay for our webinars, and you can pay after class today, and I encourage you to do that because 
You'll get all the handouts. You'll get some of these supplemental handouts that Jim mentioned at the start of our class today, which are a great, great tutorial aid with regard to field work. And you'll get the CPE credit. So if you're going to be taking the Certified Internal Auditor exam, eventually you'll be, need to be reporting continuing professional education. And you'll get the recording for our webinar today as well. But again, work paper quality, what constitutes work paper quality? You know, just one thing I want to say about this slide, be very careful what you put in your work papers. Why? Because so many different people may be looking at your work papers. Your work paper should only contain the audit evidence, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, that substantiates whether the control is effective. Are you there? Did you want to say something, Jim? No, it seems like we lost your audio. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. You might want to repeat okay. that. You bet. Sorry about that. So again, what, I'm, what I said was be very careful what you put in your work papers. Don't include a lot of background information. When our regulators at Wells Fargo looked at our work papers, on a 10-page work paper, nine of the 10 related to background information. It had nothing to do with the testing of the control. If you want background information in the work paper, put it in a different document. Remember, your work paper should stand on its own with related to testing the, the effectiveness of the control. As you see in that first bullet, a third party should be able to recreate the test and arrive at the same conclusion. OK, let's talk about audit evidence. Now, if you do take the Certified Internal Auditor exam, I'll just go out on a limb here and guarantee you this will be on the exam. Audit evidence is sufficient, competent, relevant, useful, good audit evidence has these four criteria. And you know, they'll ask this in a number of different ways. Just commit this to memory that audit evidence has four attributes, good audit evidence, sufficient, competent, relevant, useful. And let's take a look at it, what each of these actually mean. Sufficient information, and again, I'll let you read what's under sufficiency first. But really, it just comes back to, do you have enough information to satisfy the objectives of the test, in other words, to prove whether the control is actually effective or not, and any other person would come to the same conclusion based on the amount of evidence that you have in your work paper. Now, sampling comes into play here. I know some audit organizations have been criticized for small audit samples. And we won't be talking about sampling today, but that is something I covered in, in my new auditor training. When I was at Wells Fargo, we had a sampling tool that actually calculated a statistical sample size. We used a 95% confidence level and a certain level of precision to generate a sample size based on the number of items in the population and the level of risk. So you don't have to use statistical sampling, but you want to have enough items in your sample, enough evidence, let me put it that way, that proves to anyone that the control is effective or not. Now maybe the most important of the four, the one at the bottom here, competent. The best evidence possible. I mean, you could, have a, you could have sufficient evidence. In other words, you've got a lot of different audit evidence here, but it may not be good evidence. It may not be competent evidence. Let me give you an example of competent evidence. You looked at an original document, not a copy of a document. You yourself watched them open the vault. You didn't just take their word for it that the vault was under dual control. Always ask yourself this, what is the best evidence possible, competent evidence, that will prove if the control is effective or not? To anyone, remember, that looks at your work papers. Competency of evidence, the best evidence attainable, the best evidence possible. The third of the four, relevant. It relates to the objective of the test. We're testing the effectiveness of controls over the vault, or whatever the case may be. The reason, now this may seem like an obvious thing. I, I've got kids, and when they were younger, they would say, no, duh, Dad. You know, I don't know if you have kids that ever said that to you, like, don't you get it, Dad? Doesn't everybody get that? Like, relevant. Don't, don't people understand that? Why, why even talk about it? 
But I've actually looked at work papers where they've had a lot of audit evidence sufficient now in their work papers, but it just didn't really relate to what they were trying to prove. It really did, wasn't relevant to the testing objective. The auditor really didn't understand the best way to test for the effectiveness of the control. Audit evidence must be relevant to the testing objective. And again, here in just a few minutes, we'll look at a work paper and we'll look at the objective statement. And the final of the four, useful evidence, it helps the organization meet its goals. It's useful to the organization. And remember our discussion on COSO from the webinar on Monday, where we said that management should have good information related to whether the controls are effective or not, and they should monitor those controls to make sure that they're working. This isn't just our evidence from an audit standpoint. This is management's evidence as well that the controls are adequate and effective. So just a review here, good audit evidence has four criteria, sufficiency, enough evidence, competent, the best evidence, relevant, it relates to the testing objectives, useful, useful to the organization to ensure that risks are mitigated, to control adequacy and control effectiveness. All right, here is our third polling question today. And let me just launch this poll and then we'll take a look at it. Audit evidence consists of all of the following except which one? You're looking for a false answer here. Which one is not one of the four? Eighty-five percent of you have voted, and so far, well, the majority of you are correct. We've got one that's not. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. And again, competitor <laughs> defined, I should say, the last one is not one of the four. Sufficient, competent, relevant is, and what is the fourth, fourth one? useful, defined as not one of the four. Good job. Good job, everyone. All right. Let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Now, just a few other things before we take a look at some work papers here. All audit evidence must be approached with healthy professional skepticism. In other words, is this the best evidence possible? And could this be an indicator of impropriety, like fraud? Again, we're not really talking fraud today, but again, in your normal course of work, would you be able to identify something that doesn't look right? You know, our best auditors are usually the people that need to have the answers to the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions, or they won't move on. When I think of my 22 years in internal auditing, and I think of our best auditors, they were the naturally inquisit inquisical types. Okay? They needed to have the answers to those questions. Inquisitive types. All right? And they were not easily satisfied. And they were also experts when it came to risk. The best ways to manage risk. Okay, just a little bit of information with more information with regard to audit evidence. We've had auditors I know that I've worked with that had to testify in courts of law. That's where I go back to. Be careful what you put into work papers. These can be subpoenaed. They could end up in court. People have lost people an example was I, I remember where someone was fired, they lost their job because of the audit and they um, basically said it wasn't it was unfounded. They sued the company for discrimination or something like that, and they brought our work papers into court to see what we had documented. Again, you never know who's going to look at your work papers. But remember what we talked about. Would any third-party person basically come to the same conclusion you did? Controls are adequate and effective or not. And they could re-perform the test if they wanted to. Now, evidence itself, different nature, the nature of audit evidence varies. 
There's physical evidence. You see some examples there. Testimonials, like when we get a verbal representation from a business partner. Documentary and analytical. Now, documentary is the most common form of audit evidence. I saw this on the CIA exam one time. What is the most common form of audit evidence? Documentary. Documents that you actually look at to determine if the control is effective or not, if the control is working or not. Analytical evidence, I know I use this. I used to work in public accounting for a few years when I first graduated from college. And one of the tests we did in public accounting was to look at a balance of an account this year and compare it to the balance in the same account one year ago. And basically look to see if they basically had the same balance. And if there were lar large fluctuations in the balance, we would want some answers. That's an analytical review, comparing the balance in the, this account this year to the balance in the account at the same time last year and asking for some explanations. And you know, if I had in public accounting, let's say the balance only differed by a few thousand dollars, I would say pass on the difference appears reasonable. But when I came into internal auditing, the perspective changed totally. That few thousand dollar difference could be the tip of the iceberg to a bigger problem. So we use analytical techniques in internal auditing as well. They're widely used in public accounting. But remember, the most common form of audit evidence is documentary evidence. Before we look at some work papers today, remember this. Audit work, remember, by that I mean remember that work papers need to stand on their own and anyone would come to the same conclusion you did. I know I've said that too much probably, but that they are clear to anyone, concise, complete. Now one of the seminars I teach is a business writing class. It's titled Writing to Achieve Results. And you know I teach it extensively right now for audit organizations. It helps you write audit reports better, engagement letters, but it's really a business writing class. And it really gets at clarity and conciseness of thought and expression. What? One of the things we talk about in that class is whatever you write, and certainly in work papers, that you are clear and concise in your writing. Clarity and conciseness of thought and expression. Because the problem many people have when they write is they lack clarity and conciseness of thought and expression. And in that class, we talk about how to achieve that. And your work paper certainly should reflect that. Be careful, as I said, what you put in work papers. A lot of people think more is better when it comes to work papers. That is not always the case. Remember, you only want to include in work papers what satisfies the objectives of the test. Is the control effective or not? And this is the wrap up before we start taking a look at some other work papers here. Um, before we get into this a little bit further, again, I just want you to remember this from this little segment of our webinar today. Remember that was a key learning point that any third party person can re-perform the test and reach the same conclusion as the auditor who originally performed the test work. Always ask yourself this question. If you were the auditor doing this, can you answer it yes? If you're an in-charge auditor reviewing work papers, can you answer this question with a yes? So now just a summary before we get into some work papers here. Again, I won't go through all of this again. We've talked about a lot of this. But in the third bullet, we will talk more about findings and recommendations today. Typically, most audit organizations during field work, if they come across a substantial control problem, a substantial control weakness, they will put it in writing and give it to the business partner. And the business partner must respond back to, and to us in writing how they will fix the issue, their corrective action plan for addressing the root cause of the issue. We'll talk much more about findings and recommendations in just a few minutes. But again, that's a, an essential component of the control effectiveness testing. If controls are not effective, if controls are not working, how will you communicate that to the business partner? And by business partner, I'm talking about the people that you're auditing, management. Some people call them clients. Some audit organizations call them clients. Again, these are the people we're auditing. I call them business partners. How will you communicate your control weaknesses to them? And the fourth bullet, always remember your work papers are confidential. 
typically only the audit organization should be able to have access to the work papers unless, let's say, a regulator or a public accounting firm has requested access. We would know that in advance. That should be a highly controlled process. But typically, you would not let the business partners look at your work. I mean, if I were committing a fraud and I knew what the auditors were going to look at, it sure would be nice if I could look at their work papers and I could see that what they're actually going to test. No, our work papers are strictly confidential. The last two bullets there, I'll just mention this. As I travel around the country and I'm doing training for audit organizations, many audit organizations, when it comes to regulatory problems, in other words, we find regulatory control weaknesses. In the work papers themselves, they don't actually say it's a regulatory violation. The wording that's used by many audit organizations is violation of company policy. They don't actually cite the regulatory violation in the work paper. Now, why is that? Well, I'm sure they don't want to raise flags for the regulators when they come in and look at the work. And also, we're not always legal experts. We may need to get our legal department involved. And we can protect ourselves, our work papers, under attorney-client privilege, depending on the nature of the, of the problem. Again, just be careful in how you actually word some regulatory findings. If anybody has questions about this, that, just shoot me an email after the webinar today and I'll be happy to get back to you. Again, field work is all about testing control effectiveness. And one thing I wanted to mention before we get into our work papers today is good auditors understand the business. Now, what do I mean by that? I think I mentioned this in the Internal Auditing Basics webinar on Monday, but just as a review, what's the very first thing you should think about when you're assigned an audit? Most auditors think, well, I need to understand the risks in the business and then the related controls that mitigate those risks. And that sounds like a great answer. But really, the first question you, you should ask is, what's the business? What? What is the business? Do you understand the goals and objectives of the business, the key strategies of the business, the business processes they use to deliver their products and services, the technology the business uses, the regulations that affect the business? I mean, what is the business? What do they do and how do they do it? And then, what are the risks? What are the controls? You may think, well, I'm new to auditing, Bill. I'm not really sure you know, I'm going to be a business expert. That's okay. We'll talk more about this next week when we talk about interviewing skills and how you get knowledge from the business partner. But eventually you will have good knowledge of the businesses you audit. Our best auditors are risk experts. And kind of just as a little, uh, a couple other things today. Again, uh, the last bullet on this slide, um, be alert for irregular or suspicious activity. Could you identify a red flag of fraud? I mean, I don't want you leaving our webinar today to, to think that your main objective when you're in field work is to identify fraud. No. But in the normal course of your work, could you identify a suspicious activity and get somebody else to take a look at it? an investigator, or a legal person, okay? That's just part of field work. Our best auditors are able to do that. I, I can tell you I've seen frauds go on for years because auditors did not raise their hand. There were red flags, and they passed on those red flags. You're our first line of defense when it comes to fraud detection. If you pass on something, it could go years before it's actually discovered. Communication is a big, uh, you know, a big piece in communicating with the in-charge auditor. You know, um, you'll notice the first bullet there, it says inform the, the auditor in charge of any situations where an expansion or constriction of scope should be considered. Now, what does that mean? Well, I was on an audit project one time, and, um, and a newer auditor asked a question to another auditor, another staff auditor, and this person said, do I have to do this test? Uh, I noticed we didn't do it last year. We didn't do it in the previous audit. And the auditor said, no, I don't think we need to do it. Uh, I noticed, yeah, we didn't do that last time. You don't need to do it. Now, remember, this auditor did not ask the in-charge auditor that question. This auditor just asked another staff auditor this question. 
Well, when the in-charge auditor started reviewing the work a week later, and it was like the last day of field work, the in-charge noticed this test wasn't done. And the, the in-charge said, we have to do this test. And the auditor said, well, this other auditor said I didn't have to do it. No, no, we have to do it. There's significant risk here related to this control. Always, always, when it comes to scope, you go through the in-charge auditor. If you have any doubts at all whether you need to test the control or expand testing or reduce testing, you work through the in-charge auditor who may work through the audit manager who may work through the chief auditor in making a final determination. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at some work papers to emphasize some of the things we've been talking about today. And I'll kind of jump back and forth now between the PowerPoints and the um, and the work paper itself. I'll just show you some generic examples of work papers today to emphasize a few critical points. Most work papers will have the risk statement and the control statement as part of the work paper. Now remember, the work paper is really where you're testing the effectiveness of the control. The control is mitigating a certain risk. So there should be a statement with regard to what is the risk related to the control. In other words, what what risk is the control designed to mitigate here? So I would recommend most work papers have a risk statement and the control statement, and then you test the effectiveness of the control. Remember this. We talked about this in our risk webinar a few weeks ago. A well-written risk statement can help you sell your recommendations to the business partner. In other words, when you're testing the control effectiveness, if the control is not effective, you go to the business partner and you say, hey, Mr. Business Partner, I noticed this control is not working. The example I gave in our risk webinar was, hey, Mr. Business Partner, I noticed you're not reconciling this account. The business partner could come back to you and say, well, I don't care. I don't have time. And the mistake most auditors make, remember this? The mistake most auditors make is they try to sell their point of view based on a policy. In other words, they tell the business partner, well, don't you know there's a company policy that requires you to reconcile, but the business partner may still come back and say, you didn't hear me. I don't care. I don't have time. Now, what should you say if you're the auditor who uncovered this control weakness? Here's what can happen if you don't reconcile. Here's what can happen if this control is not working. We just had a $7 million fraud because they weren't reconciling a similar, similar account. Oh, yeah, you have to reconcile here. Remember this, you always sell your point of view. You always sell your recommendation based on risk, not on a policy, not on a, some criteria. Okay? Well-written risk statement should help sell your recommendations to management and identify the controls that should be in place. And now the control statement, it should help you assess the adequacy of the control. Remember control adequacy, the design of the control? On paper, is this control a good control? and help you decide how to test for the, the effectiveness of the control. Work papers should include a risk statement and a control statement. Well, let's take a look at uh, some of the work paper components here. And uh, again, I'll kind of jump back and forth between the PowerPoint and the work paper itself. So let's go to a work paper here. And just showing you an example, many audit organizations use Lotus Notes. So I just pulled one out of the Lotus Notes software here that you can see as an example of a work paper. Remember I said earlier, work papers are often called test documents. Why? Because this is where we test the control effectiveness. And here's an example where at the very top of the test document, you see a risk description and the control description, just what I was talking about. But let's talk about the objective statement and the testing steps themselves. So I'm just going to go to the objective statement of, of a work paper. And as you see there, it says, and this is on, that, on the PowerPoint, the test objective in the test document should be stated in terms of evaluating the effectiveness of the controls and assisting management to mitigate risk in achieving the following objectives. A well-written written objective statement should be directed at direct the auditor to test the effectiveness of the control. Look at the example there. This relates to business con continuity planning, and the objective of this work paper is to determine whether the business continuity plan, backup recovery procedures, and testing 
effectively, control effectiveness, right, ensures timely recovery of operations in the event of service disruption. There should be an objective statement in the body of every work paper. Now let's go to the test steps section. It's going to go down here to another test document. The in-charge auditor should write testing steps that direct the auditor to test the effectiveness of the controls. I'll talk about the X's here in a minute, but just look at number one, two, three, et cetera. These are testing steps that the in-charge auditor wrote to help the auditor test the effectiveness of the controls. They should be risk-based. Direct the auditor to test the effectiveness of the controls. Going back to the PowerPoint here for a second so you can see that. And prompt the auditor to identify, analyze, evaluate, and record audit evidence and results, as well as utilize data analysis techniques wherever possible. Direct the auditor to test for control effectiveness. That's always the objective with testing steps. Let's go to the next piece of our, of our work paper here. And let's talk about the source and scope sections of the work paper. Let me go back to a work paper here. So in any good work paper, I'm just going to go back up here to the top of the work paper, there should always be a scope section related to that particular work paper. Now what do I mean by a scope section of a work paper? The scope section should include the source of your information, like the names, titles, you see there, of the team members talked to, and the names, dates of documents, reports that you're going to review. And who did you obtain those reports from? It should also include information with regard to your audit sample. What's the total population? How did you select your sample? How did you come up with your sample size? Here's a learning point for you today. The scope section of your work paper should provide any third-party person information with, re with regard to how you were going to how you were going to satisfy the objectives of the test. What was that? Your scope section of your work paper should show anyone how you set out to accomplish the objectives of the test. Who are you going to talk to? What are their titles? When did you talk to them? How did you pick your sample of items to, to test? Anybody should be able to look at your scope section and know how you set out to accomplish the objectives of the test. Now the testing section itself. And let's go back to the work paper. We talked about audit evidence. Also, let me just talk about the, an attribute testing here for a minute. Many audit organizations, when they, have, when they create work papers, will set up like an Excel spreadsheet for testing control attributes. Reconciling is a good example. In other words, if I was the in-charge auditor and I wanted you to test controls related to reconciling, I might set up an Excel spreadsheet and have separate columns for each control I want you to test. Like, was the reconciliation prepared by someone who didn't make entries to the account? Was it approved by someone who didn't reconcile the account? Was it prepared timely, et cetera? The different controls that reconciling requires. So I do recommend that. I mean, this can really help direct the auditor to make sure they're testing the right controls and documenting how they actually test those controls. But what if the control is not effective? And this is that last bullet there, and we'll talk much more about this in just a few minutes, where it comes to exceptions and issues. Let's go back to the work paper for just a second. So I want to make sure everybody's with me here. You're the auditor doing this test. What happens if you come across control weaknesses? In your work paper, you should do something to flag the control weakness. Many audit organizations use like red X's. So for example, I know this isn't in color today, but X1 would be the first control weakness I identified, X2 would be the second control weakness I identified, and X3 is the third control weakness I identified in this area of testing, in this work paper. Okay, and many audit organizations will classify uh, control weaknesses with regard to significance. Is this a big deal? or not a big deal. Look at X1 there. One of 45 loan documents were not being placed in the proper file. 
And you'll notice a percentage there. I do recommend that as well, that you actually flag the percentages of errors that you notice. And I actually flag this as an isolated occurrence. In other words, no big deal. Probably not even going to report this verbally to the business partner. But look at X2. 5 of 45, 11% of everything I looked at was a problem. 5 of 45 loan documents were not properly approved. This is an exception. In other words, this is a bigger deal here. It's not an issue in recommendation yet. But it's something I'm going to report at least verbally. It's not an isolated immaterial exception. Now, this is something I'm going to at least report verbally to the business partner. Look at X3, 10 of 45, 22% of everything I saw was a problem. 10 of 45 loan documents were missing collateral information. Is this isolated? No. This is an exception. I'm at least going to report this verbally to the business partner and I'm probably going to write a finding and recommendation and put it in writing for the business partner. And again, we'll talk much more about findings and recommendations in just a few minutes. Now, source documentation, then what does this mean? If you do come across control weaknesses, do you keep copies of those control weaknesses in your work papers? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, should you keep copies of everything? Probably not. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, many audit organizations use electronic work papers, so you could actually scan examples in a scanner, examples of what you saw as the problem, and you could embed that electronic document right in the electronic work paper. And I actually recommend that. At least a couple examples of what you saw that was a problem. But remember, any third party should be able to re-perform the test. So your sample should be well documented that if they wanted to, they could go back and pull those other problem items and look at the documentation for all of them if they wanted to do that. But my advice would be at least have some examples of control weaknesses that you actually identified and include those in the work papers, either electronically or as hard copy documents. At the end of every work paper, I'm just going to go back to the work paper here. There should be a conclusion. Let's go to the conclusion section here of the work paper itself. A conclusion related to the effectiveness of the control. Is the control effective or not? Now, some audit organizations use like a five-tier rating scale. Because they have a five-tier audit rating, they'll have a five-tier rating scale at the bottom of every work paper that says controls are either strong and effective, effective, generally effective, all the way down to ineffective. You don't have to do that. The main thing I want you to remember is this. You need to have a conclusion statement at the bottom of your work paper that concludes on the results of your testing. Is the control or are the controls, if you tested multiple controls, are they effective? or not. And here's my rationale for why. Let's go back to the PowerPoint here. And again, just some definitions for if you did go to a five-tier work paper system, what each of those ratings might be for, for, for your conclusion statement. All right, we'll come back to control weaknesses here in just a minute, but again, just some basic field work tips before we get into findings and recommendations. You want to always make sure you communicate frequently with your in-charge auditor, especially with regard to control weaknesses and any scope changes, as we talked about previously. You should also communicate frequently with the business partner. Now, let me just say this. When I was at Wells Fargo, we would send out a survey at the end of the audit to our business partner, the, the people we just audited and asking for feedback on us. You know, what did they think of the auditors that were on the audit engagement, and what did they think of the audit itself? You know, most of the comments we received back from the business partners were extremely complimentary, extremely positive. But do you know the one comment that was not always complimentary? They criticized us for lack of what? Lack of communication. You know, the business partners don't understand our audit process. When you identify a control weakness, they may think it has a substantial effect on the audit report rating when really it's a minor control weakness. 
or just the reverse of that. They may think it's minor when it's really a big deal. They don't understand how you're going to write the report and how you come up with the audit rating. They don't understand the follow-up process, that you're going to come back and do more testing to make sure that they fix the issues we identified. Communicate, communicate, communicate with the business partners. You cannot over-communicate with the business partners. And also, by the time the business partner receives the audit report, any control weaknesses should have been discussed with them numerous times. No surprises by the time they receive the audit report. You cannot over-communicate when it comes to communicating with the business partner. If you do receive review notes, that third bullet on this slide here, be sure you address those review notes in the, in the work paper, in the test document itself, so that nobody else who looks at the work paper would have the same question. And as we said earlier, always be alert to indications of irregular or suspicious activity. You are our first line of defense. Hopefully you would be able to recognize fraud if fraud were evident in a work paper. All right, just some basic field work tips. Well, a big piece of field work is the identification of control weaknesses. So why do I have this slide that says killing a spider? <laughs> well, a few years ago in the Internal Auditor magazine, and if you are a member of the Institute of Internal Auditors, you will receive the Internal Auditor magazine. It comes out every other month, and it has many excellent articles that will help you learn and grow in the profession of internal auditing. One of the articles was titled Killing the Spider, and really kind of a unique title. Why would they have this article in the Internal Auditor magazine? Because it related to issues and recommendations. The most significant level of control weakness, how do you communicate these weaknesses to the business partner and what should you be looking for when it comes to their corrective action plan? The gist of the article was this, that when you make a recommendation to the business partner in strengthening internal controls, it should always address the root cause of the issue. What? Whenever you make a recommendation. <laughs> To a business partner, whenever you identified a control weakness that you're putting in writing to a business partner, you want to make sure that your recommendation addresses the root cause of the issue. And when the business partner responds back to you with their corrective action plan, you want to ensure that their corrective action plan addresses the root cause of the issue. Now, what does this all mean? Well, let's take a look about this a little bit further. Why would they call this article killing the spider because it's really the difference between if you use a spider analogy actually killing the spider itself so it could never make any more problems for us no more webs or just cleaning up the webs and not killing the spider because you know if you just clean up the spider webs let's say you're cleaning your basement or something and you don't find the spider that caused the webs you're going to come down into that basement a few weeks later and you're going to find those webs back again, right? You know what I like to think about when I, when I look at this slide? Have you ever gone to the doctor? You've got some pain, let's say. And you go to the doctor and you say, hey, doctor, I've got this pain. And what does the doctor say? Well, here's a drug. Take this drug and call me if you don't feel better. And you come home, like I came home one time from a doctor's visit, and my wife said, what happened? And I said, well, the doctor gave me this drug. And she said, yeah, but why do you have that pain? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, he just said, take this drug. It's like he just treated the symptoms, but he didn't address the root cause of the issue. Because just because I take an aspirin or Tylenol or ibuprofen or something like that, that doesn't tell me why I have the original pain. It just masks the pain. It doesn't get at the root cause of the issue, right? Maybe it's a bigger problem here. I don't want them just giving me a drug. Before I take the drug, I want to know why I have the pain. And this is the essence of what you have to keep in mind whenever you're communicating a control weakness to a business partner. Hey, Mr. Business Partner, you're not reconciling your general ledger account. Remember what I said, they'll come back, I don't care, I don't have time. You sell your point of view based on risk. We just had a $7 million fraud. 
But my recommendation for how to fix this issue is going to get at the root cause as to why you weren't reconciling. You didn't understand the reconciling policy. My recommendation is you provide training to all your staff on the reconciling policy because that recommendation is going to get at the root cause of the issue. Why, did, why weren't they reconciling? Because they didn't understand reconciliation. Okay, you need to provide training on the reconciling policy. Kill the spider. All right? You always want to ask yourself this question, what is the root cause of the issue? Do you understand the root cause? And then, does your recommendation address the root cause of the issue? One other thing on this slide here before I move on. Too often, as you see in the second to the last bullet there, auditors focus on the conditions but ignore the causes. And too often, the last bullet there, auditors simply compare what the auditor area is doing with what the policy states it should be doing. Remember one of our previous webinars, I said many newer auditors are viewed as just a bunch of checkers. They're just a bunch of checkers. They're just people that check for compliance with some policy, but they really don't know why the policy exists. They really don't know why the control exists. In other words, what is the underlying risk that control is designed to mitigate? You need to be able to identify the risk and know the best ways to mitigate risk when you're making recommendations to the business partner. If you don't understand the underlying risk, how can you make a recommendation as to the best way to mitigate that risk? What is the best control they should have? You don't want to just be a checker. Hey, I'm just checking to see if they're reconciling to comply with the policy. Because if they're not, I want to be able to sell my point of view based on risk, just as I was talking about. When we have control weaknesses, it's generally a breakdown in one of the five COSO components. Remember, those of you who attended the Internal Auditing Basics webinar on Monday, the five components of internal control that should be in place. In other words, if companies are managing risk appropriately, the five components of internal control as defined by COSO are control environment. What is that? Culture, tone at the top, code of ethics, the base of the pyramid a strong culture that the management of risk is essential to the success of our company. Risk assessment. Management identifies the risks in their business. Management assesses those risks, knows how significant those risks are. Control activities. Management identifies the best controls, control adequacy, and understands that those controls are working, control effectiveness, in the management of those risks, in the mitigation of those risks. Management has good information and communication. They have information that tells them if controls are working or not. They have communication amongst their people that people understand their control responsibilities. And management monitors their controls on an ongoing basis for any changes in their businesses to make sure those are the best controls for mitigating risk and the controls are actually working. The five COSO components. Before I talk more about issues and recommendations, remember the work paper I was just showing you, and let me just jump back to that here that I was just showing you a few minutes ago. That in the work paper itself, you should flag the control weaknesses. Is it an isolated immaterial exception, or is it an exception that we're going to communicate verbally to a business partner, or in fact, will it become an issue? That's what this PowerPoint slide is getting at here. Whenever you identify a control weakness, there's pretty much three levels. The first one, no big deal. I'm not even going to tell the business partner about this. The second one, I'm at least going to report it verbally. And now the third one, the issue and recommendation. I'm going to write a formal issue and recommendation in writing. I'm going to put this in writing to the business partner, and they will have to respond back to me in writing and how they will actually fix the issue. Okay. And if I do write an issue and recommendation, it will, pro it will end up in the audit report. It will be formally reported via the audit report at the conclusion of the audit. Now, we may have given this to them in writing during field work, but it will still end up in the audit report as a summary of the issues that we identified during the course of the audit. 
And typically, those issues will be flagged with regard to their significance. Is this high risk, moderate risk, low risk? Was it a repeat issue, something we saw in a previous audit? What is the root cause of the issue? And some companies actually have risk categories, like compliance risk or reputation risk, that would be flagged as well. All right, and as we said, they're typically communicated in writing. They go to the business partner during field work. The business partner must, must compose a written response that addresses the root cause of the issue. AIC stands for Auditor in Charge. SAM or SAM stands for Senior Audit Manager, and there are different titles in audit organizations. But anything that's in writing that goes to the business partner should definitely be reviewed by the in-charge auditor and the audit manager. Now, when you do come across, when you do write an issue and recommendation, you should validate it with the business partner. What, now, what does that mean? You should go to the business partner and say, Mr. Business Partner, I noticed you weren't reconciling this account, for example. Should this account be reconciled? And he may say, or she may say, yeah, definitely. Or should this, should this, um, this reconciliation have been improved? Yeah, definitely. Because I noticed it wasn't approved. You just want to validate that the business partner is in agreement with you that we have a problem. You just want to validate with the business partner that when I identified this control weakness, you agree that it is a problem. It is, it is a control weakness. And when I do write this as an issue and recommendation, you see they're under management response. And I'll let you look at the bullets here. But I'll just say this. Remember, the main thing you always want to look for in a response back from the business partner, and again, this is their corrective action plan and how they're going to fix the issue. Does their corrective action plan address the root cause of the issue? Kill the spider. Okay, I'm going to go to our issue, a little bit more on our issue and recommendation, a key learning point today. So I skipped past a couple slides because we had already talked about that with regard to exceptions and issues. And let's focus on, again, the most significant level of control weakness, the issue and recommendation. Now remember, some audit organizations call, call these findings and recommendations, so F&Rs instead of INRs, the same thing. And I know I've said this several times already, but if you take the CIA exam, I'll guarantee you this will be on there. And what do I mean by that? That a well-written issue and recommendation should have five attributes, a condition statement, a criterion statement, a cause statement, an effect statement, and a recommendation statement. I like to think of these as a series of what questions. Condition, what is the problem? Criterion. What should be? In other words, what should they have been doing? What should they have been following? Like a policy would be a criterion statement. Okay? Cause. What led to the condition? What led to the problem? Effect. So what? That should be your risk statement. In other words, if the business partner came to you when you presented this issue and recommendation to them, and they said, so what? So what if I don't have this control in place? The effect statement would answer that question. Risk, right? So what if I don't reconcile? Well, we just had a $7 million fraud in the same type of account because they weren't reconciled. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's why you need to reconcile. That may be the most important of the five, that risk statement, because remember, we always sell our point of view. We sell our recommendation based on the effect, based on the risk. And finally, recommendation, what should be done. And remember the recommendation, well, you see at the bottom there, should address the root cause of the issue. But you sell your recommendation based on the effect, based on the risk. Let me show you an example from a, a work paper here of a issue and recommendation. Just to give you a feel, if you haven't looked at these a lot, it's going to show you an issue and recommendation out of a work paper. So look there under issue and recommendation. Here's the issue. Management is not reviewing loan files to ensure documents are approved and collateral is documented. We noted 5 of 45, 11% loan documents without proper approvals. 10, 22% of these documents were also missing collateral information. There's the condition statement. 
there's the problem. Again, I'm going to use Wells Fargo as an example because I worked there. The Wells Fargo credit policy requires all loan documents to be approved and collateral to be documented. There is the criterion statement. That's what they should have been following, a policy, for example. Management indicated they were not aware of the policy requirements. There's the cause. Condition, criterion, cause, and now the effect statement, which is under the risk category, Lack of proper approvals and collateral information could expose the company to substantial loss. And if I could have made that even more specific with regard to the effect, it would be even more, even better. It should be an attention grabber for the business partner when I present this issue and recommendation to them. Recommendation. We recommend management provide training to all staff members to ensure compliance with the Wells Fargo credit policy. Remember, the recommendation should always address the root cause. What was the cause? Management indicated they were not aware of the policy requirements. So my recommendation is saying, OK, provide training to your staff on the policy. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Always remember these five attributes. A well-written issue and recommendation should have a good condition statement, criterion statement, cause statement, effect, and recommendation. Well, I thought just to pique your interest here, here's a couple questions out of the Certified Internal Auditor exam. This is typical of what you would see on the CIA exam, testing your knowledge of those five attributes. So here's the question. We find that due to inadequate monitoring of cost-effective transportation and hotel options, the department's travel budget has increased steadily by a total of 1% per quarter. Thus, failing to achieve management's objective of reducing travel-related expenses by 1% over the same time period. What's the question? Which of the following elements, elements of a well-written issue and recommendation now, is missing from the findings stated above? Remember, condition, criteria, cause, effect, recommendation. Which one is missing here? Now, they didn't have a recommendation, so we can leave that one out. But which one is missing? Because you see the four from our pick list here. Well, let's go sentence by sentence. We find that due to inadequate monitoring of cost-effective transportation and hotel options, what's that? That is the cause. Cause of what? The department's travel budget has increased steadily by a total of 1% per quarter. There's the problem. They've got an increasing travel budget. Why? because nobody's monitoring for cost-effective transportation and hotel options. You've got the condition, you've got the cause. Now what? Thus failing to achieve management's objective of reducing travel-related expenses by 1% over the same time period. That's what should be. That's the criteria. So we had in the first sentence a cause, and the, we had the condition, and now we have the criteria at the end of this, or in the first line, I should say, we had the cause. Second line, we had the condition. And now at the end of this, we have the criteria. Which one is missing? The effect. The risk. So what? Right? That's what the risk statement has to answer. Remember what I said. If you go to the business partner, and the business partner says, so what? Who cares if I don't have this control in place? The effect statement the risk statement should always answer that question. Here's what could happen if you don't have the control in place. Here's another one from the CIA exam. <clears throat> Late charges were waived on an excessive number of delinquent installment loan payments at the Spring, Spring Street branch. We were informed that late charge waivers are not approved by an officer. Approximately $5,000 per year in revenues is being lost. In order to provide a better control over late charges waived and loss of income, we recommend that a lending officer be responsible for waiving late charges and that this approval be in writing. Which of the following elements of a deficiency finding is not properly addressed? Same question now. Which of the following criteria is missing? Which of the following elements of a well-written issue and recommendation is missing? Well, again, let's go sentence by sentence. Late charges were waived on an excessive number of de delinquent installment loan payments at the Spring Street branch. What is that? That's the problem. 
that's the condition. We were informed that late charge waivers are not approved by an officer. There's the cause. Approximately $5,000 per year in revenues is being lost. There's the effect. Which one of these is missing? The criteria. Okay? The criteria statement is missing here from the issue and recommendation. So just to back up here, because this is an important learning point today with regard to our topic with regard to field work. Well-written issues and recommendations, always remember, should have a condition, criterion, cause, effect, and recommendation statement. All five should be in place. I like, to, as I said, to think of them as a series of what questions. Big learning point here, you always sell your recommendation based on the effect. So what if I don't have this control in place? How would you respond to that? Well, we just had a $7 million fraud because they weren't reconciling. There's the risk. But your recommendation should always address the root cause of the issue. Why weren't they following the reconciling policy? Nobody understood it. Okay, let's have some training on the reconciling policy. Kill the spider with the recommendation get at the root cause of the issue, and when you do receive management's response back, be sure it addresses the root cause of the issue. All right, let's go to our last polling question today, and I'll just put this up in front of you. Which of the following is not an attribute of a well-written issue and recommendation? Again, we're looking for a false answer here. Which of the following is not an attribute of a well-written issue and recommendation? And I'll just leave this poll open. 64% of you have voted so far. Give it a couple more seconds here. So far, everybody has it correct. Again, you're looking for a false answer. Ah, we had one person miss it. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. The correct answer here is validation. That is not one of the components of a well-written issue and recommendation. What are the components? Condition, criteria, cause, effect, recommendation. Again, if you ever take the CIA exam, I will guarantee you it will be on there. And before I open this up for question, just a, a couple other things. Remember, once you're done writing an issue and recommendation, you probably should flag it with regard to risk. Is this a low risk issue, moderate risk, high, or possibly a very high risk issue? The reason we do that is it, will, it can actually affect the way we follow up on issues. In other words, at the conclusion of the audit, once we issue the audit report, and once the business partner has completed their corrective action plans, we will go back and retest to make sure that the issues have been corrected. And so if you were on the original audit, you may actually go back and do further testing to ensure that they fix the issue. For high-risk issues or very high-risk issues, we're typically going to go back pretty much right after they, they complete their corrective action plan. But for low-risk issues or moderate-risk issues, for those, we typically would look at those during the next scheduled audit project. Okay, so for high risk, very high, we're going to go back and do testing before the next audit, typically within maybe 30 days of the date they completed their corrective action plan. For lower risk issues or moderate risk issues, we may wait until the next scheduled audit to actually take a look at, to make sure that they fix those issues. Okay, so at this time, Jim, I'm gonna open this up for questions. And I just wanna thank everybody today for, for, for uh, joining our webinar. Again, th this is my contact information. You can always reach me at bill at woodingtontraining.com. I'm offering Three audit seminars, new auditor training, that's what this topic was from today, auditor in charge training, and I am an IIA instructor for CIA exam review. I teach also three professional development seminars, writing to achieve results, which I talked a little bit about today, 
I'm a Ken Blanchard instructor for Situational Leadership 2, and I have a Leadership 101 class that relates to team building. Again, I'd love to come to your organization and deliver on-site training. Please contact me, and we can talk further about that. And if you have any questions with, with regard to the webinar today, please don't hesitate to contact to contact me. With that, Jim, I'll I'll open it up to you and to any questions that may have come in. Thanks, Bill. I don't see where we've got any questions that have come in, but uh, I think we have a couple of additional slides that are there. Right, the training without travel. I uh, just wanted to you know remind everybody that uh, if you attended today's webinar paid and answered all the polling questions in compliance with NASBA standards you will receive your CP certificate within 10 business days uh, if you attended today's webinar but didn't uh, pay but would like the CPE and you met the standards uh, you can pay the registration fee after the fact we'll be glad to uh, to handle or make arrangements for for payment and if you find that these webinars are are uh, providing value-added information for you, either for as a new auditor or as a uh, as an auditor who's looking to freshen up and uh, refresh your uh, your knowledge in these topics. We really do encourage you to uh, to pay because we really uh, we we will continue to offer these, but we will be restricting access. And, uh, and making some changes to the program as we go down the road. Uh, we do have some additional uh, documents that we are distributing today, and we also have a special offer that uh, you can pass on. If you're not the, uh, the person in charge of uh, CPE for the office, you can pass it on to them. But basically, for one low price, uh, for $300, you can uh, have everybody on your staff uh, participate and receive CPE and this is you know you won't find any other organization that's offering this kind of uh, uh, bargain with uh, with CPE uh, and if you wanted to sign up for more than one there are prices there for additional so you know if uh, you wanted to get uh, you know five five classes which is I believe bill it's going to be at least seven and a half uh, CPE credits for a thousand dollars for as many staff as you have that's uh, that's a, a rock rock bottom price and I think that uh, you know we've had very good success with this with the uh, anti-fraud webinars that we've been running and uh, we're extending the same offer to the uh, to the internal audit webinars so I just wanted to bring that to your attention uh, in, in closing, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today, and I wanted to thank you, Bill, for putting on another excellent webinar, and, uh, you know, everybody that's out there listening, you really need to consider, you know, if you need somebody to come into your organization and put on a, a presentation, uh, I know Bill is very well respected as an IIA instructor, and he'll do a great job. If you're a financial institution, uh, Bill has got a lot of experience. Uh, with Wells Fargo so you know he can impart some of his best practices that he learned over the years at, at Wells Fargo and uh, and share those with you in a in a face-to-face -face setting so in closing I'd just like to say that the purpose of our training without travel webinars is to provide you with high quality low-cost online alternative training solutions covering timely topics with value-added resources and tools that you can use in your job we bring the world's best subject matter experts directly to your desktop with timely information. The next webinar in our series is Assertiveness Skills, and uh, we look forward to you joining us for that, uh, that webinar. So with that, Bill, have a great day, and everybody out there that's uh, joined us, uh, have a great, great day and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. I know.